awesome. It's going to be good. You should keep clapping. Awesome. All right. Um, right then. So my name is Josh Long. You can tell because it says it. Uh, that's my website. That's my Twitter handle. How many of you are on Twitter, just by the by? OK, I'm expecting at least 20 more followers. Come on, guys. On it. Get on this. Um, email. If you leave this room more confused than when you came in, you have recourse. There's my email. Please take it down. Josh.long at springsource.com. I'm very happy to hear from all of you. If you have questions about any of the open source Spring portfolio projects, please don't hesitate to reach out to me, OK? Mm, OK. Um, yeah, stuff. I, I've written, what is it, four books on Spring. I'm working on my fifth uh, with Manning. Those are a couple of them. That one on the right, that's free. Springsource.org forward slash Rue. You can get the O'Reilly book. Open source. Right on. Go O'Reilly. Um, I'm a contributor to several projects at SpringSource, including Spring Integration, Batch, and the original Hadoop stuff, and the, also the uh, Activity Workflow Engine, and other projects that I haven't even bothered to put on there. Um, some of you may know me now, actually, from this roundup I put together every Tuesday on SpringSource.org. It's called uh, This Week in Spring. That's up today, by the way. Uh, and it just basically collects all the blogs, tutorials, videos from the community, like yourselves, um, that are of interest, or perhaps you know blogs and tutorials from springsource.org itself, right? All in one place, so you don't have to trawl the thousands and thousands of uh, blog posts that I do every week for you. Um, all right, moving on. So quick recap, how many of you guys are using Spring, just out of curiosity? Okay, how many of you are using Spring 2? Okay, 3, right on, 3.1, 3.2. Oh, so awesome, I love it. 3.7. 3.8, exactly. Yeah, no, that's cool, man. And 4 is coming soon, so that, that'll be appropriate. Um, well, no, okay, so you guys have a kind of a mixed variety here. I'll go ahead and, and sort of recap some basic things. Indulge me if you've heard it. Just stick around. I promise we'll get to the more interesting bits. Got to, you know, equalize, okay? All right, first things first, why are we here? Spring is a framework. What is a framework? Bob Martin provides the best definition. He says that software entities, classes, modules, functions, etc., should be open for extension and closed for modification. I think that's very, very important, right? Because Spring is just a library. And you can plug in the bit that you want and keep the rest. The other reason you, we're here is because Spring provides a lot of value. Helps you to avoid reinventing the wheel. This is an important, important thing, guys. If you wouldn't believe how many problems you could solve just by spending a few minutes looking through the documentation for Spring and all the other various Spring projects. Um, and there are many. I'm not going to like. Can we turn the light down a little bit or something? It's yeah, we're terrible. Right, so anyway, we have lots of different modules, and they all build on top of the core component model, the core Spring framework. Uh, we have support for batch processing, integration, big data, Hadoop, rich internet applications, web services. I mean, just name it. We probably have something that can help you. Uh, and if you build on top of the core Spring component model, you're now sort of insulated from the underlying platform and that allows you to build your application and move it portably and con you know, cleanly from one environment to another. In the sort of battle days before 2005 when we had dinosaurs, um, people were using Spring because they wanted to get their application away from the dinosaur-like application servers. How many of you have had the displeasure of using WebSphere? Show of hands. Show me on the doll where it touched you. Okay. Um, we all, we all did it once in college. We've all tried it, WebSphere. And um, there is a better way. And that's been true for a long time now, right? But increasingly, we're seeing people making the exodus not just from big application servers like, like WebSphere, but to uh, more nimble, more able platforms like the cloud, right? So we're seeing people move to VMware, you know, corporate owner of Spring Source, by the way, TM. Uh, VMware is the very own Cloud Foundry and various other cloud platforms. And this has just been sort of like the, the trend, right? In, in general, we're seeing people using Spring more now than we, are, than we did before because there are more platforms with more variety and with more sort of uh, nuanced challenges. Uh, moving on. Let's get back to this. So, okay. In the core Spring framework, we have the core Spring framework. And then above that, you have the web modules, uh, the web support. This is core HTTP-centric machinery. This is somewhat rec recap. If you've already seen this, that's okay. Just hang on tight, I promise. Um, if you are using Servlet, if you're using Servlet 3.0 and Spring 3.1, for example, we have this little nicety. This is a uh, uh, the ability to configure a Spring web application completely in Java. You just create a class, 
This is the equivalent to web.xml. Okay, this is a web.xml replacement. You just RMRF web.xml, put this class in there, and it automatically gets started up when the Servlet 3 container gets started up. And here we can programmatically register the Spring MBC dispatcher servlet and set up the annotation context, the application context, and just get off, you know, go to the races with our stuff. There are other little utility objects that come in the core web machinery kind of packages, right? We're not talking about Spring MBC here. This is still just the underlying web stuff, right? And this stuff is really cool. I, I mean, this is like, for me, it's actually kind of nice because you just kind of trawl through these little packages and you find these great little gems. Um, and this, is, this owes a lot to the fact that Spring was originally written. The original code, the very first lines of code in Spring were concerned with the web, right? They were concerned with building web applications. Before it was a gen general purpose dependency injection mechanism and so on, it was a web framework, okay? So there's lots of great utilities in there. If you're just using uh, regular servlets in JSP, which you know, I hope you're not, but if you are, these guys can be very helpful. For example, you can use the uh, delegating filter proxy to manage and uh, manage a regular uh, POJO and then expose that as a, f a Java servlet filter, for example. <coughs> if you're using the uh, once per request inter uh, filter, this can be very useful for things like authentication that need to happen once in a request processing chain and then you can just, you know, you get a, you get a mutex so it doesn't happen again. Uh, lots of convenience classes. If you've used regular servlets and, or some other web framework with Spring, you'll no doubt have run into a web application context utils. It's got a static method that you can use to get a reference to the application context if you give it a reference to the servlet context. So you trade in one for the other. Very convenient. Um, hopefully you've, you're not you know, running on top of raw core servlets though. Hopefully you're using something higher level. And in this regard, Spring has always provided very good support as well. From day one, we've had support for uh, struts and Java server faces. Well, you know, when Java server faces was available, we had it uh, as well in the core Spring packages. We have Java server faces one and two, struts one uh, are all provided in the core Spring uh, distribution. When other frameworks, uh, <coughs> when other frameworks ship, good gravy. When other frameworks ship, they also provide support for Spring in their packages, right? So Tapestry, for example, has for many years provided a Spring module. And uh, Wicket has Spring support and Stripes and all these other different web frameworks also provide support for integrating with Spring. So there's no reason to go it alone, right? If you're using some other web framework and you want to use, uh, get access to your Spring back stuff, that's fine. We also have uh, good support for GBT and Flex. In fact, our Flex support um, is remarkably good. Not that anybody uses Flex anymore, but if they did, this is the way to go, you know? Um, <clears throat> I, of course, am a wee bit biased, having spent the better part of the last eight years working with Spring MVC very ably. Spring MVC is now, I'm going to go ahead and say it's the most entrenched, sort of most widely used Java web framework. There's lots of different ways to measure it, but most of them seem to confirm that. Um, it's a very simple concept, right? HTTP request message comes in, goes to the uh, front controller, in this case the uh, dispatcher servlet. The dispatcher servlet scours all the uh, configured controller beans that are registered by Spring MVC, looks for the one that can handle the request, routes the request to the controller, and then the controller does some sort of business logic, packs up the results in a, in a model object, basically a glorified map, sends that map to the view where it can be rendered, and then sent back to the client, right? Basic model to MVC, this is old stuff. We've seen this from, you know, struts, right? This is like old, old stuff. Here's what a modern day, uh, <coughs> Spring MEC controller looks like. It's a, it's a little underwhelming, right? It's just a little class. You have the at controller annotation. Uh, that's a Spring MBC annotation. If you want to tell Spring MBC, you know, if you want to give Spring MBC something to do, you need to create a method, a handler method, and that method will have metadata on top of it, re request mapping in this case. That method, that, that annotation specifies metadata about the handler. In this case, it specifies which URL this handler corresponds to. So which, whenever somebody brings up that browser page with that URL, this method in, gets invoked. You can specify sp specifics. You can say, okay, I only want HTTP GET requests routed to this method, okay? Um, you can ask Spring MVC to provide references to certain objects. For example, you might, you might want access to the native HTTP servlet request, for example, to extract the context path. 
but I recommend very strongly against this practice. Whatever you can, write your code in such a way as to decouple yourself from the low level raw HTTP servlet stuff, right? Let Spring MVC extract the various values for you. In this case, we're using the at request parameter uh, annotation to extract and have injected uh, this parameter. Now, this controller, written thusly, is imminently unit testable. You can take this into JUnit, mock it, do whatever you need to, pass in method parameters and so on, no problem. And then in your controller, it works as well. And of course, we have support for SEO friendly or bookmarkable or whatever you want to call them, URLs. So here we've got URL of my forward slash curly bracket ID, curly bracket. That curly bracket ID bit is a path variable. It will be extracted at runtime and made available as this argument, the path variable ID long ID, okay? So if somebody passes in five in that URL, that gets passed into the method for you to handle. Um, up until this point, oh, whoops, I forgot one last thing. You also have the model, right? We've got model view controller. You need the model. This is where you stuff data to be made available for rendering in the view, right? So assume you're in the model, you're in the controller, you've done some sort of business operation, looked up some sort of data, you need to make, up that, make that data available to the view for rendering in the confirmation page, okay? Here you inject a reference to the model, say model add attribute, add customer, you know, using a uh, customer service object you've injected from somewhere else, okay? Add that attribute and then that gets made available for, for dereferencing inside the view. Thus far, we've used a public string, you know, whatever, right, process the request. And we've always used the same string. These strings as return values are uh, view strings. They're, they're used to resolve a view. And they're plugged into a strategy called the view resolver. You can plug in your own view resolver. But by default, for example, um, this will re render a JSP page. It'll look for a JSP page at the root of your application and suffix it with .jsp. So if the, if the JSP file is called home.jsp, this will get rendered. Um, but that's not the only way to do it. You can programmatically return a view object directly. Okay, so you can just short circuit the view resolution process and programmatically build your view. For example, if you're doing XSLT or PDFs or spreadsheets or you know, things like that where it doesn't really make any sense to resolve some other view, right? You can also just stream data back if you like, very common use case. Um, so okay, so that's just absolute core basics like if you've been under a rock for the last 10 years. You know, I, I've updated it with Spring MVC 2.5's basic bits, uh, but let's just, we're just recapping, okay? Just bear with me. Let's take a look at the demo here. I'm fully aware that most of you have uh, worked with MVC in the last 10 years, I hope. Wait, just, just to be sure. Maybe, how many of you have worked with MVC in the last 10 years? Oh, okay. Whew. Yeah, why not? Good stuff. Mm. So I'm inside of the uh, Spring Tool Suite. This is a uh, free as in beer and free as in uh, liberty, open source IDE. Um, based on Eclipse, it provides all the useful plugins that you'd otherwise spend hours pulling your hair out, downloading, configuring, and sacrificing goats to make work uh, when you get the fresh cuts of Eclipse, right? It's already got all that stuff, so you don't need to worry about it. The only thing it doesn't have is a little button for speakers so they can change their font size readily and quickly without this pain. Okay, so this is a very, very basic uh, Spring MVC web application on the left here. You guys can follow along at home if you like. You go to github.com, Josh Long, and it's called, adds to the uh, tension, a walking tour of all of Springdom. Go ahead and take this code if you like. It's got a whole bunch of stuff, not, not the least of which is the stuff we're gonna look at tonight. It's got big data, it's got messaging, integration, web services, rich clients, all sorts of good stuff, guys. Uh, please, take a look at it. Um, let me know if there's anything you don't see well represented there. Um, okay, so this code, this is the, oops, control X. This right here is the absolute, absolute simplest possible Spring MVC application, you know, um, What's up, my friend? He's got that look in his eyes. It's the absolute simplest Spring MVC application. No, I'm, I'm sorry. Take that back. Now it's the absolute simplest Spring MVC application uh, possible, okay? It's a configuration class. You can tell because this says uh, at configuration. And it's got at enable WebMVC. This starts up and installs all the machinery for handling Spring MVC controllers. 
and for processing Spring MVC requests. Uh, and then from there, it has a whole bunch of defaults. Out of the box, this little configuration will give you, based on whether you have the appropriate libraries on the class path or not, it'll give you support for uh, JSR 303 validation, form validation, data, you know, RESTful uh, payload validation. It'll give you support for uh, file upload, if you have commons file upload or the servlet3 javax.part.part API. Uh, it'll give you support for RESTful uh, web services based on JSON or XML, if you have JAXB or Jackson on the class path. Um, it'll give you a default JSP rendering strategy. It gives you a whole bunch of stuff. Stuff that, you know, between you and me, I wouldn't want to have had to configure myself using struts 10 years ago. Do you guys remember struts? Me either. Yeah. Oh, God, that was a horrible thing. I remember, like, if I could get file uploads and validation and internationalization working in one struts app, I was a rock star. I mean, that was so hard to do 10 years ago, you know? And now it's down to just one class and an annotation. Kids today, they don't know. Anyway, um, the nice thing about this is it's useful out of the box, very sane, good default, but you need to add, you need to tailor some things as befits your application, right? This is going to happen. And the nice thing about Spring MVC is that it's imminently tailorable, you know? You can fine tune and, and tweak every little part of it. Um, I would start, where are you, with that, right? This is the uh, WebMVC configure adapter. It's an base class that implements an interface. It has no ops, right? It's just an abstract class with no op, no op implementations, nothing in there. Um, and these are just callbacks. These are just callbacks. I'm gonna go ahead and import my service because we need that. Um, and these are just callbacks and then from there, you can override the callbacks as, a, as is appropriate, right? So the first thing you'll notice I've done is I've overridden a couple things down here. I've overridden uh, configure default servlet handling. This tells Spring MEC to go ahead and turn on the default servlet. You guys may not know about what the default servlet is because it's never really it just sort of works in some cases, right? The default servlet is the servlet that renders things that don't have a servlet mapped to them otherwise, right? So if you make a request into a servlet container for like, you know, forward slash foobar, and that isn't mapped to any servlet at all, who renders that? Well, the servlet container does, right? But how? It didn't, I don't remember registering servlet container or servlet, you know? Uh, there's a default servlet. All servlet containers have them. Uh, however, in their infinite wisdom, they made these default servlets Bound, they bound them to different keys. You know, you, you can look them up through magical keys and ways of, like JNDI in some cases, magical keys in others. It, it, it changes from server to server. So if you still want to take advantage of this really, really good, you know, friendly default servlet that's already there and it's primed for spitting out resources from the file system, oh yeah, um, then you should. You know, this is this is good to have. You don't want to like throw that away. But Spring MVC needs to find it for you, and it knows how. But you have to turn it on. So here's a here's an example of turning it on, right? And um, the other thing I want to do is I want to make sure that whenever somebody goes to this directory, it just renders everything in that directory straight on, straight on through. I don't want to have to write a controller to render JavaScript files, right? That's ridiculous. Just pipe it through. I've got images and JavaScript and CSS. Render it, right? Uh, and then finally, we're adding a, in an interceptor. An interceptor is the Spring MVC equivalent of a component, but it has an idea of all the managed beans in a typical request processing chain, so it knows uh, about the life cycle of Spring MVC controllers, so it's a lot more um, integrated than a, a regular filter. I've also added struts, uh, no, not struts, Apache tiles. This is old school. I know you guys have seen tiles before. Uh, tiles just lets me compartmentalize my u user interface, and we'll see why that's useful later. Once I've done this, once I've registered these two beans, now this is regular Java configuration style for beans. If you're using the XML right now, you can cross compile that to XML. You can say bean ID equals view resolver, class equals the return type of that method, and then the object that's configured is the return value, right? So this object is what's registered under the application context and made, avail made available for injection. It's called Java configuration, and it works whenever you see at configuration. It's the same thing as using an XML file. Um, Questions on that? Because some of you may not have seen that before. Okay, moving on. Now, once I have that uh, at configuration class up and running, I can create a very simple controller. Here's an at controller. And this will handle, you know, working with customer data. It's a very simple sort of canonical thing. We've done it, I'm sure, all a thousand times. Somebody goes to forward slash, 
it'll call this method, it'll pass in the ID, cast it and make it available as a long, give me a reference to the model. I can add data to the model uh, here using my service and add the ID as well to the model. And then that gets rendered, or sorry, that gets forwarded to the view, which in this case is customers forward slash display. That's using a view resolver, remember that? So that's gonna look over here. Go back here, go back to web app, web inf. Oh boy, customers, display, right? And there we go, I've got a very very basic, old school HTML3, you know, just t table, HTML table. Not a big deal, you can see I've got dollar sign curly bracket customer dot first name dot last name dot whatever. I'm dereferencing the properties available in the model object from my view. Okay, so far so good. Very, 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 very simple. That's absolute like, you know, 2008 level Spring MVC. We're all on the same page. Moving on. We have to move on. See, I know you guys didn't come here for that, um, but it's, help, it help, it's helpful to recap to make sure we're all on the same page because there's a lot of stuff to talk about and some people get, you know, to different points in the road and they don't, they don't follow. Um, and we have a little bit more looking backward to do before we can look forward, but it's important to, cont to contextualize it, right? Um, many years ago, before electricity and dinosaurs, there were amber and green screens. And these things roamed the earth like dinosaurs. Just really, really dumb, dumb. So dumb. I mean, we're talking, whew, oh boy. Insert uh, needless US political joke right here. Um, really dumb, guys. Just dumb, dumb, dumb terminals. He's had all the smarts on the server. The, the clients themselves, the, the terminals themselves, had no smarts whatsoever. Very dumb, you know? Um, and they, get, they did the job. But something wasn't quite right, right? Because each, each terminal had its own rendering mechanism, and so each application, if it was going to be written correctly, had to be rewritten for each kind of terminal. Um, it got really, really old really quickly. And then a marvelous, magical thing happened right around 1990, right? Uh, this gentleman named Tim Berners-Lee in his laboratory at CERN uh, on a Next machine. This is a Next cube. I don't know if you guys can see the, the label and the lighting in here, but it's a, uh, it's a sticker on what was on the back of a Next machine. These are the machines that Steve Jobs sold after he left Apple. Uh, well, he was ousted from Apple in the 80s, okay? Uh, these are amazing little machines. Only 50,000 of them sold, and uh, uh, great machines, like the predecessors to OS X, you know? And so, of course, it's natural that uh, in the ivory towers of academia and uh, science, a guy like Tim Berners-Lee would write the first HTTP browser and the first HTTP server. Okay, and this sticker, this, uh, this sticker, this says, this machine is a server. Do not power down. That's so awesome. You know what that means? I mean, that means, that means that if you were there, if you were lucky enough to be in this laboratory, like minding your own business, running around shuffling papers, and you didn't see that sticker, and you know, you could just like trip and fall over and unplug the internet, you know? The whole thing. Oh. You have no idea how much I want that. I want so bad to be able to go somewhere in the world and find the big plug. I know we don't have it anymore, but if we did, I'd, oh my God, and watch the whole thing go gray. It'd be the most productive hour of coding ever, you know? Um, but anyway, so that was, the, that was the internet, right? HTTP, well not the internet, HTTP. And that's awesome, and it worked very well. And uh, the only problem was that it wasn't really very good for uh, client-side applications. We still had all the smarts in the server, and really, 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 really stupid clients. Uh, and this reminds me of a cartoon. And for those of you who can't read it, I'll read it for you. That's what I'm here for. So, D Dilbert goes to his boss, uh, and he says, I'm grossly underpaid. I want a raise. To which the pointy-haired boss responds, oh, Dilbert, Dilbert, Dilbert. What, 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 responds Dilbert. People don't work here for the money. They work here for the challenge. And Dilbert responds, well, if challenges are more valuable than money, then why don't you give me your money and I'll give you my challenges? And of course the boss thinks pensively and says, I must kill him before he infects the others, you know? This is what I feel like has happened in the last 10 years. A lot of people have really gotten it in their heads that they want the challenge. They want the hemorrhoids, you know? I don't know, I mean, I want the money. So I, uh, when I look at the problem of having really stupid clients, really stupid clients, the right response is not to put all the smarts on the server, it's to make the client smarter. In short, 
Java server faces is no way to run a railroad, guys. And this cartoon proves it. I think I've tied that all together cohesively. You'll see my point. If you don't, that's okay. Um, either way, we shouldn't be trying to shove all that server-side state, all that client-side state into the server, into the session. It doesn't belong there in the first place. And we didn't have a really good alternative up until about 2004. Then a magical thing happened, right around 2004. I forget the specific date, but at one point it was called DHTML and JavaScript, and then the, the next day it was called Ajax, right? Do you guys remember when Ajax was born? Yeah, that was a very confusing day. The only thing I can think of in recent memory that happened, when I'm not even that recent, the only thing I can think of that's even close to that situation was at some point in the last 50 years, I think it was like Switzerland, they had people driving on the left side of the road and then they switched to the other side. But it happened over one day. So if you didn't get the memo and you were on the road the next day, oh, no amount of coffee is going to prepare you for that. You know? I think that's what happened. I think at some point we all just woke up and realized that you cannot keep doing this. It's not going to scale. You know? So people started building these really, really smart applications. I mean, you guys saw it. Google, you know, Google Maps. Do you guys remember the first time you played with Google Maps, that interactivity, that dynamicism? Um, People started building really, really smart applications, things that had very sophisticated user interfaces and lots of functionality, all rendered on the client. And these made these applications, right here, boss, come on. Oh, yeah. Um, so these, these made the applications you know, really, really fluid, a whole new level of fluid. And I've never seen anything like that. And I think we can all agree it's been pretty good. Eventually, people started you know, hacking these browsers, making them do things they weren't supposed to do. And eventually, these things were sort of rolled into the standards bodies, right? And eventually the standards body, uh, W3C and various others, uh, sort of formalized all this into something called HTML5. And HTML5, wow, that has been an umbrella worth using, you know? That has been a technology platform that a lot of people are getting into. We've got things for media and audio and 3G and, you know, uh, 2G and actually, and, and just amazing, amazing things you can do in, in, inside of a regular browser nowadays, you know? Um, and because these applications are getting richer and the special effects are getting more dynamic, of course, you've got utility libraries like jQuery, but you've also got, you know, MVC frameworks, you know, whole, whole, blow, whole you know, sprawling MVC frameworks that help solve the problems of MVC on the client. Some of them include backbone.js, angular.js is one as well. I mean, there's lots of them, right? And it doesn't matter which one you use. The, the, the takeaway is that really the client side state belongs on the client and it's not hard. There are good tools. You can do a lot of things. JavaScript has gotten ridiculously fast. JavaScript has gotten amazing. People say, well, how fast is JavaScript? How, how good could it possibly be? <laughs> B-E-L-L-A-R-D dot org forward slash JS Linux. Some insensitive clod had the gumption to write a emulator to boot Linux in JavaScript, taking advantage of the typed integers and typed numbers in JavaScript. So it actually ex emulates x86 instruction sets and boots Linux entirely in memory in the client. There's no server-side state at all. Guys, if you can boot Linux, it's over. There's nothing you can't do. You can do anything now. It boots Linux. So that's how powerful JavaScript is. There's no reason to be using Windows Forms or Applets or Flex or any of that stuff. Just, it's booting Linux. Come on, we can do this. Um, so. And by the way, that thing, if you do get a chance to play with it, it doesn't take much bandwidth, although I don't recommend trying it now since I might need my Wi-Fi. Um, if, you get, if you get a chance to play with it, you can go to the core, the root shell there, and there's a C file in there. You can actually VI the C file, make changes to it, and then GCC the C file and run it all inside the browser memory. So cool. So awesome. Um, okay, so we clearly have really, really, really smart clients, you know? Uh, we've fixed it. We finally fixed it. It only took us, you know, eight, nine years, but we did. We fixed it. We have smart clients. So the problem is, okay, I still need some server-side state, right? Surely. Uh, how do I communicate? I need business state, if nothing else. That's on the server. I need to talk to that. Uh, and so then the question is, well, how do I do that? Most, you know, most naturally. And I think as an industry, we've sort of coalesced around this idea of REST, right? REST is, uh, of course, for those of you who are uh, not keeping up, the term REST was uh, proffered by Tim, uh, I'm sorry, by Roy Fielding in his 2000 doctoral dis dissertation. It has a lot of good ideas, but basically use the verbs that HTTP already provides for manipulating state and map those uh, state mutation verbs to the life cycle of your data. Put another way, when you create a, a, a database object, you think in terms of CRUD, right? Create, read, update, and delete. 
Well, it turns out HTTP already has verbs for that. So if you just think of customer data in your database, and then when you look at that and you think of these read, update, delete, and create operations in your service side, just then also imagine HTTP endpoint, right? And it's very easy to see why REST sort of just fits, right? Because it provides a way to do the same things we could do before. Um, it is a different mindset. You now have to think about things in terms of resources on the, on the web, unique resources. You have to think about uh, things like content negotiation. You have to think about directory structures and things like this. But on the whole, it's a very easy model to get used to, right? Um, and this brings us back around to where we were, which is Spring MVC today. Okay, uh, Spring MVC, it turns out, is a really, really good platform for REST. Uh, really good, really convenient. It's so simple, even I can do it. That says something. Um, you can build RESTful endpoints that are easily consumed by all sorts of clients, not the least of which are your browsers. That's good. Uh, on the client for Java objects, for, you know, if you're a Java client you're not, and you're not JavaScript, but you're Java and you're talking to some other REST service, Spring 3.0 in the core APIs provides a little handy little object called the REST template. Uh, this is a test question, guys. Take, take note. So there's, a, there's an object called the REST template. Uh, the REST template's very, very powerful. It provides one-liners for making calls across the web to HTTP resources, okay? Uh, it supports marshaling, so you can actually marshal XML and JSON to objects and back and forth, if you like, or you can just deal with abstract resources, you know? Um, here's a couple of examples. Okay, this one on the top is the one that always trips me out. Do you guys remember like DCOM and EJB and, oh. yeah, well, I mean, back in the day, we, we, we all thought we could just drag and drool these components onto a palette and suddenly we'd have access to the shopping cart for an EJB or something like that and never really kind of happened, right? But I think it kind of did, right? I mean, this is, we have now three lines here and we're embedding or reusing or object linking and embedding, whatever you want to call it, we're doing all that to the most powerful search engine in the world. In three lines, we've managed to add the most powerful search engine in the world, Google, to our application. Free of charge as it happens, there's a quota, but still, not a bad deal. This is very much the sort of simplicity I was looking for, I was looking for 10 years ago. I would love to be able to just, this is what I wanted, I wanted to be able to drag and drool and get that, you know? So the result is I got a REST template, I got a URL, it's got a, query, a path variable, it says curly bracket query curly bracket, I call REST template git for object, pass in the URL, I tell it that I expect a string result back as opposed to a RSS feed if I'm looking at an RSS feed or an image if I'm looking at binary data or whatever. And then the third argument is a uh, variable argument list. So that third argument could actually be five or six arguments, right? And that, that query, in this case spring source, is what's substituted into the URL, the curly bracket query, okay? And then that, made, that request is made and the whole body is bundled up for me, exceptions are handled and all that stuff, it's bundled up and given back, and given back to me as a result. You can imagine doing something slightly more complicated. Here's a fictitious hotel booking site um, that uses the REST template to you know, look up the information for a hotel, passing in certain IDs. You know. The REST template, as I mentioned, has convenient one-liner methods for all sorts of options, all sorts of uh, calls, you know, delete and get and head and uh, options and post and put, of course. If you feel like the method you need isn't particularly well uh, represented among these uh, high level methods. There's a generic fall through pair, exchange and execute. Um, to give you an example of how little I use those though and how little I expect you will use them, I have no idea what the difference is. So they're there, but they're probably not gonna need them. The first six will do just fine. Um, so this is a simple Spring MVC controller. Back to where we started. It doesn't look all that different from what we looked at just a little while ago, in fact. Uh, in fact, I would, I would struggle to pick out what has changed, uh, but that's okay. I'm, that's what I'm here for, guys. I've got this, because I changed it. That one little thing is a, is a return value, where before we returned strings and views and maybe uh, responses of some sort. Here we're returning a basic domain object, something that's intrinsic to our system, uh, and we've annotated it with the at response body. This is just a pojo. You could get it from wherever you want, right? Um, all I'm trying to do is to say, yeah, I've got this customer data, it's got records. I'm gonna go ahead and punt on solving the problem of actually rendering it in a way that the client can deal with. But I know that this is what the client wants. So here it is, and Spring MVC, can you please marshal it as appropriate, right? Look at the request, look at what the client wants, and then re return it in such a way that it can be useful for the client. Um, I can do the opposite, right? Here I can say, okay, well, I'm a, I'm a server-side endpoint, 
And whenever somebody posts a, a request to me, I want that request data to be unwrapped and converted into this job object for me. It'll automatically take the post payload and convert it to that job object. Understanding, of course, that if it's invalid or whatever, you'll get on the client side, you'll get faults and all that, right? Um, okay, so that's, yeah, you can do both read and write, right, very easily from REST. This is the same thing as we looked at before, except instead of re returning a view, you're just working with objects, you're working with data, right? Going back and forth as a client and as a consumer. And of course, all the other stuff is there as well. So for example, path variables and all that stuff are still there. The more astute of you, which is to say all of you, I'm pretty sure, but uh, the more astute of you will notice that I've uh, gleefully ignored one little thing, which is the, the browser doesn't support, the common browser today doesn't support uh, HTTP put, HTTP delete, you know, anything but get and post, basically. So all this good stuff about REST kind of goes out the window when you've only got two of your verbs available to you, right? Uh, and that's actually, that's true, but we have a workaround. It's a very well, well-known workaround, right? Uh, it's called the hidden HTTP method filter. You put it in your configuration, your web.xml or in, in the uh, application initializer that we looked at earlier, and it will sit there, sift through all the results that are coming in, look for any of them with underscore method as a request parameter, and if the underscore method is there, and the method is like, you know, put or delete or whatever, it'll route it to the appropriate Spring MVC controller. So this way, even if you posted the payload and you intended it to be, to be a call to a delete method, it'll get routed to the right method, right controller method. So in this way, you have now all, all of your verbs available to you from JavaScript uh, for the cost of two, okay? Now then, let's see. So going back to the code, I've got a different controller here. We saw the regular customer controller that works with regular JSPs and stuff. Here's a more rusty uh, version of it. I've got actually up here this headers thing in which I'm telling Spring MVC that only clients that can accept JSON or XML are allowed. This is sugar. I can actually do, um, I can use this other one here. I can say consumes equals, and I can just specify that if I want. But I like the, uh, I like the, what are there? I like the, you know, explicitness of that, okay? Um, and then I have different methods here that are going to be used to handle actually working with the data. So for example, the first one is a method that, you know, once posted to can be used to update customer data. I have another one down there that it can be used to retrieve customer data. So if anybody goes to forward slash customer forward slash five, they can retrieve my data. Uh, and then of course another one to add data, right? I didn't create one for deletion just because it's bad karma for demos to create something that's open on the network that deletes my test data. So I don't do that. Um, but, all the, but basically it's the same thing as we looked at before, right? Just a controller with a bunch of at request mapping annotated methods. Uh, we don't have to change anything else. And then once we've done this, we can actually see the data in action. So if I go here, customers seven, you get that, which is a fail. There you go. So there's my first uh, RESTful payload, right? I've gone to HTTP, colon, forward slash, forward slash, uh, mobile mvc 31cloudfoundrycom forward slash customer, forward slash seven, and I've got an XML representation of that customer data. This time, in this case, being plucked from a database, okay? Uh, this data is for ID number seven. If I go to this little client, and this is why I'm using Firefox, I know it's pass A, but somebody's gotta use it, and uh, they have this great little client, and there are many, but this one's my, it's a near and dear favorite, okay? It's called the poster. You plug in the URL here, specify a, a, a header. So in this case, I'm gonna specify the accept header. I'm gonna specify that I can accept um, application JSON. And I'm gonna go ahead and reissue that call. This time, I'll get back a JSON payload, a JSON representation of the same thing, okay? So this is like really, really, really powerful, right? Very, very simple uh, way of working with data. Try doing that with RMI, you know, or Corba or, you know, just, it won't be fun, right? Um, so I'll take that. And of course, I can do more. Let's see. If I add that. All right, who wants to be famous? Give me a first name. Don't all raise your hands at once now. What? Steven. Steven? 
Okay. With an E? E. Oh. Eh, right. oh. Oh. E. E. Oh, I think you said, okay, E-V-N, goody. And you're, uh, there you go, you're Smith. Cool, dig it. Customers, so that's gonna go to the customer's endpoint here. And I'm gonna put, put that thing, and it's gonna fail utterly and completely because I forgot to specify the content type, application, JSON. And I'm gonna put, and then I get a, uh, confirmatory dialog telling me that he has been added to the database and he's been given an ID of number 14. We can confirm as much by having this all sorted out right before the talk instead of in the middle of the talk. But since I didn't, VMC apps, sorry folks, Postgres. I'm gonna log into the database here. We'll let that happen in the background. Uh, Postgres is, uh, Number three, what do you think? Okay, number two. For those of you who haven't seen this, by the way, this is the VMC command line tool. It's a little tool to work with the Cloud Foundry open source cloud. I use it because I'm lazy and I have a lot of demos and I'd much rather just have them up and running all the time so I don't have to worry about it. Um, you guys should use it because it's easy stuff. But this is also really nice. This is a, the VMC command line tool. I think it's a very friendly command line tool. If you'll note, we actually created a tunnel here to punch a hole in the cloud and talk to the remote services managed by that cloud. Uh, and then we're, we're asking it to give us username, password, and you know, schema connection string information that we can use in our visual tools like PG Admin or whatever. Um, it has done us one step further, right? It has done us one more thing. It's not only given us the information we need to be able to proxy into that database, it has offered to start a command line tool for us on our behalf. This is really, really cool. I don't know, I mean, this is like if you were petting a cat you know, and then when you were done petting the cat, the cat went out and found you another cat to pet. You know, very, very friendly, very hospitable cat. So, number two, and then uh, drops me into the shell here, select all from customers. On that, there you go. So there's Steven, okay? Been added to the uh, system here. Okay. So that's a very simple example of how to use and work with RESTful endpoints from uh, the browser, right? Just using a browser, I didn't have to install any special tools, really, just basic services. Um, of course, the question is, well, I've got, you know, I've got this cool RESTful endpoint, but what's the, oh, yeah. Quickly, that, the request body annotation you're using to, you know, that's what gives us the body of the request, like in JSON, mm -hmm. starts up a Jackson instance and populates the flow joke kind of thing. Can you put, Yes. Uh, yep. At put the at valid right there, and it works just fine. Um, you bring up a great point, and I'm sorry I glossed over this. The handling of anything annotated with at request body and at response body, in this case at response body, is handled uh, by something called the HTTP message converter. This is an interface you can plug in your own. By default, based on conventions, we have support for Jackson. We have support for JaxB. We have support for uh, you know, Rome RSS feeds, we have support for, so you can do Atom or RSS, we have support for buffered images, for example, if you want to read, download a JPEG, you just do, you can say I want buffered image, java.odd.bufferedimage.class. Um, we have lots of different types, and you can plug in your own, right? So for example, there are lots of different recipes out there for plugging in a JSONP, HTTP message converter. Uh, there are recipes out there for, you know, iCal and all that stuff. Just, just get whatever implementation you want and plug that in. Right then. So okay, we've got REST, what, what's the use of REST? What's the use of all this cool stuff if we're just building a web application that works on one web page that just talks to the same host? We're back where we started, we have one app. It's just a very fancy, very smart client, but it's still, still just one app, right? The real value of REST is in, as an enabler. It decouples your user interface from your web application. When your web application just becomes a RESTful service endpoint hub, and now you're free to start building applications that are appropriate for each type of device, right? We live in a new world, a very interesting world, you know? Um, we are probably all using Android. How many of you are Android? Okay, how many of you are iPhone? It's okay, you don't have to be ashamed. Yep. Um, no, I mean, most of us are probably using one of those, right? Let's be honest, especially in the uh, sort of ivory tower bubble system that is Silicon Valley, we have those uh, devices. But Android's everywhere, I'm, I'm here to tell you, except for parts of Scandinavia where Nokia still clings on tightly. You know, 
Um, and except for parts of uh, India where you have like blackberries and stuff, they're everywhere. These are the two big two ones, you know? These are everywhere. So if you're gonna build a, um, an application today, you probably should target those two first, native. Build them native, totally. I'm with you on this, okay? This is absolutely, this makes sense. Uh, there are other platforms out there, though. Um, I've, I mean, come on, who's, who's rocking a Blackberry? It's okay, it's okay, you're with friends. Anybody, there's always one guy in my audiences, when, like, you know. Um, Blackberries are out there, can't afford to ignore them, we know they're, they're out there, uh, so you shouldn't deprive them of your application. Um, Windows Mobile, Windows Mobile up until like six months ago, I used to liken it to the Higgs boson particle. I was convinced that it was theoretically possible that they existed, but there was no proof. And I'd never actually seen one in the wild, so I wasn't sure. Um, Did it get delivered before you ordered it? it, it yeah, exactly. exactly. It's like very quantum, you know? And, and they've actually discovered the Higgs boson particle. So really, there's nothing that is as mysteriously absent as the Windows Mobile. But I'm told it's out there, and you would do well to support them as well if, if you can, OK? Uh, and, and for this, we have something called Spring Mobile. Spring Mobile is a a, uh, a solution to return a response based on the type of client. Very simple. I'm going to show you a uh, little, little sliver of the functionality that this provides. But the basic idea is that you, know, you build your native solutions for the top two, maybe even for BlackBerry for those. You know. and, and, then, and then you let the rest of those clients consume HTML5 form factor sp specific and form factor appropriate uh, user interfaces. I'm not saying you should build the most fancy application possible, but build, but build something that can be used in these devices in a convenient way, right? So that way they, they can still access it. It might be a degraded version of your user interface, uh, but it's still future-proof, you know? Somebody t decides to bring up your application tomorrow on their car, you know, the computers are today, you know, nowadays cars are running applications. Um, this will still work, hopefully, you know? So, Spring Mobile is this guy. All that introduction for that one little line. It's registry .add interceptor new device resolver handler interceptor. Okay? Once that interceptor is there, it sits there and sort of filters all the requests. Uh, it doesn't filter them, it augments them. Okay? It enriches every single HTTP request coming into the, to the, the uh, service. And based on a, a strategy, uh, it looks up the type of client that is requesting it. You can plug in whatever strategy you want. We have a simple one based on heuristics for detecting, uh, you know, tablets and phones and, you know, big, big, big screen devices and all that stuff. Uh, you can use things like WFURL, which is a sort of a very, very dense database of every kind of known type. You can update that if you want. You can do whatever you want. I mean, any, you know, anything you want. Um, and that information is made available in the request attributes that are provided to all the controllers. Um, <clears throat> in my case, I'm using that information inside of tiles. Right? So you've got, for those of you who remember Tiles, it is a good uh, template engine. And in particular, it gives me the little bit of indirection I need to conditionally render a response based on the type of device. Here I'm using broad strokes, and so I'm uh, rendering one template in the mobile directory if the current device attribute in the request is, has the mobile flag set to true. Okay, so that's, you know, Java being indirection. There's a current, current device attribute in the request that the device interceptor has added, right, based on the request. If it's mobile, uh, some kind of mobile, for, for whatever de definition of mobile this implementation of the resolver is using, uh, it'll look inside the mobile directory for page.jsp. Otherwise, it'll look in the standard directory, okay? So if you look at my, my directory structure here, I've got two folders, layout and then mobile, and layout's standard. And inside of mobile, I've got a regular page here. In fact, this page, the thing that's interesting about this page is not so much what's there as what's not, right? Most of this is just commented out. You can see it's very underwhelming. It's a couple of tiles attributes and some basic HTML doc types and all that stuff, and not much else, right? Uh, and then you go back over here to my standard page, and you can see I've got, you know, dressed to the nines. I've got CSS and Dojo and lots of JavaScript and complex DOM nodes and everything, right? Look at all that stuff. And one will get rendered based on uh, the conditions, right? The specific, the, the, what I specified in that device resolver. So for example, going back to my application, here's the application as it is by default. This is the Dojo one, right? I've gone to my application, mobile MVC 
cloudfoundry.com. And you can see I've got Dojo. How many of you have used Dojo? It's like five, six years old. It's or more than that, right? 2004. So it's a very old JavaScript framework. I don't recommend it at all. Um, it's just very big. I mean, there are Linux kernels that are smaller now. So yeah, that's really, really, really big. Don't use it. Uh, it's very fat. And that's why I specifically cite it, because it'll you know, burden your web page. In a way, I can't really. I just can't. Ugh. So don't do it. This, look at this page. It's very big. You've got more than a megabyte of JavaScript being downloaded on every request. It's got all sorts of things like these accordions on the left that pop out and move around and do all that sort of stuff. If I type in a number and hit go, it shows me a pop-up, which is pretty pointless, and it shows me another one. And you know, all this stuff is sort of against the grain of mobile devices. You don't want accordions and pop-ups in a mobile device. This is a completely terrible user interface for a mobile device or for even, even for a tablet. You know? So if I go to mobilembc.cloudfinder.com and I do id equals seven, same thing as before. This is a shortcut for what I just did. You know, I get that. And then I go to the uh, Android emulator I happen to have running here. Doesn't everyone keep an Android emulator running on their laptops? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. I am convinced that no one at Google's ever used the emulator. It's awful. Watch this, actually. You'll see this nonsense. Oh, good. It's already pre-cached. But normally, when I do this talk, there's three. I've got three keyboards in front of me. Three. And the one that works is the one that requires me to point and click. <laughs> really? <laughs> nah, -uh. it's not cool. So I'm going to go back to Alt, choose Equals, go back to ABC, number one, two, three, choose seven. Santa Maria, OK, go. OK, so you can see I've hit the URL. I brought up the same application, same page, except in this case, I've gotten the sort of, you guys can just scarcely see it, I imagine. It says information on the customer, number seven, first name, last name, print up information, and the basic footer, OK? So the same URL, same application, same everything. It's just that the response is different based on the type of device. So now you have a good fall through experience. Um, you know, even for your fall through experience, you should be doing something much better than this, of course. This is a demonstration. Please don't ship anything that horrible. Um, but it works, right? That's good. But like I said, you should still build stuff for the native, native phones, native devices. And this is a very interesting market, right? Uh, like I said, you can't afford to ignore Android. It's everywhere. It's number one platform by far. Soon it'll, out, it'll outpace computers, like you know, modern desktop PCs, all of them, ever. You know? Imagine more Androids than Windows, Mac, Linux, and everything else combined. You know, uh, iPhone itself, of course, is still continuing, continuing on very strong. Very, very cool technology chain there as well. Um, so I re definitely recommend you build native where appropriate. And uh, for this, we have something called Spring, Mo Spring Android. Spring Android is a lot of things. Uh, it's a little library that we provide that works on top of uh, Dalvik, not Java, Dalvik. Dalvik is the language that runs on top of the Android virtual machine. Yes? Anything. Spring Mobile, like the only thing you really showed was that interceptor. Is that like? That is, there's a couple of things related to like site preferences and cookies and all that stuff. But it's basically how to correctly handle different, how to render appropriately based on the type of uh, client accessing your server side resource. Okay, so it's a server side story. Okay. It pretty much includes the Spring Mobile dependency and that interceptor. And That's, well, there's more to it. I just showed you this. You can, all do, you can also do um, like language you know, switching and all that stuff as well. But, but yeah, that's, that's where I would start. And it's very easy. There's not a lot to, you know. Um, Spring Android, on the other hand, is a similarly light library that you can use on the Dalvik virtual machine. Dalvik, for those of you who don't know, is a language that looks exactly like Java and runs and executes exactly like Java, but for legal reasons, isn't Java. So we're just going to call it Dalvik, OK? Um, Spring Android provides lots of cool stuff. It does not provide dependency injection. This is a common thing people ask us. And there's a reason, lots of, lots of good reasons. The Android uh, runtime kind of gets in the way of the life cycle for these objects. If you have a screen or an activity, as, as it's called in Android, Android needs to be able to own that whole process, right? There's no way for you to provide a pre-configured object and just say, run, you know? Um, 
So that gets in the way of something like Spring's ability to provide references to other dependencies, to provide AOP, to provide all the services that it needs uh, and that people have come to expect. There are solutions, um, but they're not, they're not really my cup of tea. Some of them require compile time weaving, things like that, which is kind of grody, right? Others require base classes, which is like, whoa, you know, <laughs> makes me want to take a shower, you know, it's gross. Um, so I don't want those dependency injections and we didn't want to provide such a story. If, if and when we can provide a better solution, we will. I expect that Google will provide something at some point. Presumably it'll be a JSR 330 compliant, in which case it'll be very much what you need uh, and what you're familiar with with Spring. Um, and more to the point, in an Android application, you probably don't have that many resources that need to be managed, so that's okay. It's not really a big deal. But what is kind of a big deal is communication with these RESTful services, right? That's the use case, that's the, the gap that's sort of painfully missing from uh, Android. So we provide a version of the REST template that works on Android, okay? And the REST template can be used uh, with a lot of the same kind of, uh, with a lot of the same kind of uh, styles as you would the regular REST template that we looked at before, but we don't support um, JAXB because JAXB itself depends on APIs that aren't available on Android. So we use something called simple XML. So you can do XML object marshalling or you can use JSON object marshalling. Um, but basically it's the same idea, right? You can use the REST template and make calls to RESTful resources from the Android device. And uh, if you want to work with a social provider like Facebook or Twitter, you can use the Spring Social Twitter or Facebook, for example, binding, or any of these Spring Social bindings. They work from here as well. You can do OAuth, as a, you can act as a client for OAuth using the REST template as well, right? These are all supported very nicely with Spring Social and Spring Android. So there's a lot of power here, but it's basically about connecting your applications to the back-end business services that you've worked so hard on establishing, right? Um, so back to Android here. Go to the uh, applicate, golly jeepers, freak out. Click on my little spring CRM. I'm gonna go ahead and enter the uh, ID here. The ID is number seven, remember? Now I'll t tell you guys a secret. Um, I like to be called Josh, hi. Uh, but when I was born, my dear sainted mother she would call me Joshua. And she only called me that when I was in really big trouble. Like, really big. And I knew whenever she was calling me Joshua, she was about to hit the fan, you know? So I don't really like that name, but we're gonna go ahead and use it to drive home the point. You can go ahead and click save. And, oops. So you can see up here, by the way, in the old session, number seven, Josh Long, reconnected, now number seven, Joshua Long. Right? So from one web, one web application, from one RESTful endpoint, we've managed to build and work with data from an HTTP, you know, basic curl-like, you know, visual curl client called Poster inside of Firefox. We managed to use it from uh, Dojo, that big fat HTML5 accordion-y thingy uh, web application. We managed to use it from uh, a very basic low-level form factor appropriate user interface on the client for phones and Android and, you know, Blackberry and things like that. Uh, and then we managed to build a, an Android client. I agree it's not the best Android client, but it does drive home the point uh, to also work with that data and to see that data, right? Um, what I have not done here, because we don't have, you know, well, first of all, I didn't bring the longer version of the talk, but also we don't have that much time. Um, what I have not done here is secured this RESTful service using something called like Spring, uh, Spring Security OAuth, right? I can secure it with OAuth, and then all clients consume the RESTful services by providing uh, OAuth tokens. This satisfies the, the question of how do I guarantee that the right people are accessing my web services. Um, but other than that, this is actually, this is a very, you know, you can see with just by exposing REST, you've opened yourself to a whole bunch of different types of clients. Um, and I think, I think that's it. I think that's good. Do you think I should have talked about anything else? Um, all right, guys, if there are no questions, thank you so much and have a wonderful evening. Yeah.